Hello and welcome back to MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic. In today's video, we are going to add the next 20 creature cards with mana values of 5 into our Momir Vig Cube. What's up, MTGBC? That is the MTG Burgeoning Community. Welcome back to another installment of our ongoing Momir Vig Cube series. Now, if you are unfamiliar with the goals or purpose of this series or just need a refresher, you can skulk around in the description below for a link to MTG Burgeoning's introduction to the Momir Vig Cube. And while you're down there fishing around in the description, you can also locate and click the link to Cube Cobra where you can see the entire contents of the cube as it stands right now. So for today, we got 20 creature cards with CMCs of 5 going in, and we're going to begin with Scourge of Gyre Reach, a fantastic card way back from the time of the original Innistrad block. It, it's a 3-3 three, three elemental, but it gets plus one, plus one for each creature our opponents control. So the ceiling of this card on curve, of course, if we're sitting down to a table with three opponents, this is going to be a ridiculous 18-18 for the investment of just five mana. That is assuming that every opponent summons a creature on their turn every turn from turn one through turn five, and we're the last to act. Still, even if we can't get to the ceiling, plus one, plus one for each creature our opponents control is going to make us have a very big creature for a very small investment of mana, considering how big that creature will be. Next, we're going to go mono blue with Sea Lock Monster, a 5 5 octopus that can't attack unless defending player controls an island. Way back in the day, that used to be called Island Home. So we can also pay 5 and 2 blue because this octopus has Monstrosity 3. So if this creature is not already monstrous, we will put 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it and it will become monstrous. And when Sea Lock Monster becomes monstrous, target land becomes an island in addition to its other types. So even if our opponent does not have an island, meaning that we can't send the monster at him or her, at some point in time, once we turn the sea lock monster monstrous, that is going to become an island, and that opponent is going to get attacked with an 8-8 eight, eight at least. <clears throat> Creature number three going back to mono red and another elemental. Here we have the seismic elemental. It's 4-4, four, four, and when it ETBs, creatures without flying can't block this turn. Now, there are a number of flying threats in the cube already, but I can assure you that there is a much higher percentage of walkers than there are flyers. So Seismic Elemental from the five spot, if the stars align properly, that could end up being a win condition and knock off one of our opponents if we have enough beef on our side of the battlefield. Speaking of one of those flying creatures, going all the way back to the first days of magic, we have Sengir Vampire, a 4-4 flyer, and whenever we deal combat damage to a creature that ends up going to the graveyard, we put a plus one, plus one counter on Sengir Vampire. So we can just sit back and have this as a nice blocking threat to all of those 3-3 three, three and smaller creatures, and if our opponents are unaware of what Sengir Vampire does, and we block one of them and send it to the graveyard, well, Sengir Vampire is going to get bigger by one plus one plus one counter. And if our opponents have some smaller flyers or reachers on their side of the battlefield, we're certainly going to turn the Sengir Vampire sideways at that opponent so they can either take one six of their starting life total or block with one of those creatures to let our vampire just get bigger and bigger. Speaking again of going back to the days of early or the early days of magic. We have sit. Well, you know what? Let's not even pull out that version. Let's go old school back with the original artwork of Sarah Angel. The Sarah Angel. Fi a 4 4 flying with vigilance. This was the creature back in the day, folks. 
if you get hit with a Sarah Angel, the game was pretty much GG. And here she is making her way into the cube with the iconic artwork that Sarah Angel should always have. So that is in and that is out. All right, so good in white, they had to eventually put her in blue, and that is Sarah Sphinx. It's the blue version of Sarah at Angel, all the way back from the time of Planar Chaos. It's a 4-4 flying with Vigilance, that is all. All right, Sarah Angel, look at the flying beef we have here. We got Sengir Vampire, Sarah Angel, and then Sarah Angel version 2.0. Can we continue with the flying threats? I believe we can. Next up is Shadowborn Demon, a 5-6 flyer that when it ETBs, we destroy target non-demon creature. A very, very valuable creature to have on our side of the battlefield, particularly in a format like Momi or Vig, where there are no instants or sorceries. It's all creatures all the time, and any creatures that can get rid of creatures are very, very valuable. And at the beginning of our upkeep, if we have fewer than six creature cards in our graveyard, we must sacrifice a creature. Now, this is where things start to get a little tricky with Shadowborn Demon. The only cards that will ever be in our graveyard will be lands, because whenever we summon a copy of a creature from the Momir Vig Cube, it comes into play as a token copy, and whenever a token leaves the battlefield, it ceases to exist, and our our graveyard will be filled with basic lands because each time we summon one of those creatures from the cube, we must discard a land card from our hand. So Shadowborn Demon will come down and help out for a little while, but eventually it might end up costing us as we have to sacrifice a creature at the beginning of each one of our upkeeps. But a 5-6 flyer that can kill a creature, non a demon, of course, when it ETBs, that might be enough to consider the downside of sacrificing one of our own at the beginning of each one of our turns. <clears throat> the flying fest continues as we go back to another angel, and this is Shattered Angel, a 3-3 that flies, and whenever a land ETB is under an opponent's control, we may gain 3 life in a format like Momir Vig, where each player begins with 24 life, and players need to get lands on the battlefield so that they can channel that mana into their Momir Vig visionary avatar to summon those creatures from the cube. Let's gain some peripheral life total. Let's gain some peripheral life. Yeah, let's try that one more time. Ha ha ha! Let's gain some peripheral life by the basic fundamental of putting lands onto the, onto to the battlefield. Each time an opponent does that, our life will tick up by three. All right, this flying fest continues with back-to-back -back mono white angels. It's Shepherd of the Lost, a 3-3 flying with first strike and vigilance. Now the first strike and the vigilance is very, very important because we can send it into combat comfortably knowing that it will take most likely multiple blockers to bring this creature down because of the evasiveness of flying. It may be in the best of it may be in our opponent's best interest to just take the three damage, which will be fine by us because with only 24 life to begin the game, it's only a matter of time until that life total ticks down to under zero. And the benefit of having the vigilance means that it can also be a blocker. All right, the flying continues. Now we have a harpy. It is Shrike Harpy, a 2-2 flyer with Tribute 2. That means, and that's going way back to the original Theros block, Tribute 2 means as this creature ETBs, an opponent of our choice may place two plus one plus one counters on it. If that opponent does not, then target opponent sacrifices a creature. So this can work in a variety of different ways. It's a very versatile creature to have on our side of the battlefield. Minimally, the evasiveness of the 2-2 is enough to be valuable, but having it potentially enter as a 4-4 or potentially forcing an opponent to sacrifice a creature, well, based upon the board state at the time that the Harpy ETBs, it's all going to be whatever we need, and hopefully the opponents, maybe through some political machinations, will help to, to help make our decision that much easier. Whew, all right, so what a run of flyers we had there. Seven consecutive flyers there, beginning with Sengir Vampire and ending with the Harpy. 
Well, the streak is over now because here is Siege Breaker Giant as we reach the halfway point of this video. A giant wire that's 6-3 with trample, we can pay 3 in red mana and target creature can't block this turn. That activated ability is only good if you have those basic mountains on our side of the battlefield, so make sure you load up the basic land deck with some mountains, MTGBC. <clears throat> All right, all of those flyers that we just showcased there, we got to have some way to have defense against them. So here is the Silk Lash Spider, a 2-7 with reach. It can block as though it had flying. That was back in the days before we actually had the reach mechanic. We can also pay X and 2 green, and Silk Lash Spider will deal X damage to each creature with flying. What a powerful, powerful ability, but... You only can activate it if you have those two green mana, so make sure you have those forests in your basic land library. We couldn't stay away from the flyers for too long, so we're back this time with a Siren. It's a 1-1 one, one flyer with Tribute 3, so if you remember back when we were talking about the Harpy, it's still the same mechanic. And when Siren of the Fanged Coast ETBs, if an opponent did not pay Tribute, we gain control of target creature. So we're either going to get a 4-4 four, four flyer, or we're going to get a 1-1 one, one and our pick of any creature from the battlefield. And once we hit the five spot there should be many many choice creatures from which to choose the flying can the flying party continues this time with scourge familiar a phyrexian imp that's three three it does fly we can discard a card to add a black mana to our mana pool now this could come in handy if we're hurting for the mana fixing Secondary to any of the activated abilities that we may have of creatures that we don't have any swamps on our side of the battlefield to activate. So it does give us that discard outlet. It does allow us to try to fix our mana. It will cost us one of our precious, precious lands, which if we're not discarding it because we're summoning a creature from the Momir Vig Cube, usually we're putting it into play. So only under the direst of circumstances are we most likely using that discard ability. All right, reaching the three-quarter point of this video, we hit Skull Mulcher, a 3-3 elemental with the Devour mechanic. This is Devour 1, which means as an ETBs, we may sacrifice any number of creatures. This creature will come into play with that many plus one, plus one counters. And when Skull Mulcher ETBs, we will draw a card for each creature it devoured. Now, as we've hinted at already throughout this video and throughout the series of the Momir Vig Cube, we need to have lands on our side of the battlefield to channel the mana into our avatar to summon our creatures from the Momir Vig Cube. Each time we do that, we also must discard a land card from our hand. So Skull Mulcher could give us the opportunity to have it come down, devour some of our chumpies, and then put some more cards into our hand that may give us the advantage to out-resource our opponents for the rest of the game. You know the flying is just not going to stop here, but what you may not have realized is that now it's going to be an uncolorless flyer. Here we have the Skyreach Manta. It flies, but it has the sunburst mechanic, which means it'll come into play with a plus one plus one counter on it for each color of mana used to pay its cost. So its ceiling will be a 5-5 five five if you pay one mana of each color, and if for some reason you're only channeling in colorless mana on turn 5, Five, you must have had a very, very bad draw to start off the game, and you just wasted 5 mana on a 0-0 zero, zero that comes into play and dies immediately. The flying party continues, but this is not going to be one that you want to summon to your side of the battlefield. We have a Leviathan, the Sky Swallower. It is an 8-8 eight, eight with flying. For only 5 mana in blue, you just know there's going to have to be some kind of horrifically bad drawback. And oh, is there. When Sky Swallower ETBs, target opponent gains control of all other permanents we control. So you're going to swap every single land and every single creature on your side of the battlefield for an 8-8 eight, eight flyer. Now, granted, in the format of Momir Vig, each opponent and pl each player begins with 24 life. It just takes three turns to swing in to kill an opponent 
But with this card ETBing, you lose everything. And this just helps to highlight one of the other themes woven into this cube. Not every creature is going to be uber helpful to the person that's or to the player that summons a copy of it. All right, we're down to three more creatures. Next up, it's another mono, I'm sorry, it's another colorless edition. Here we have Snow Fortress going all the way back to Ice Age. It's a 0-4 wall, so you know it can't attack. You can pay a generic mana to give a plus one, plus zero until end of turn. You can pay a generic mana to give a plus zero, plus one until end of turn. Or you can pay three generic mana and have it deal one damage to each creature without flying that is attacking us. So there are some valuable, you know, there are some valuable abilities here based upon what we're going to do with blocking with Snow Fortress. And with enough mana available, let's face it, this could be a very, very powerful mid to late game mana sink specifically with its ability to deal direct damage to creatures that are not flying that are attacking us. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right, creature number 19. We're going colorless again, and this time it is Solitan, a 3-4 that we can pay one blue mana to untap. But again, you can only activ activate that ability if you have an island on your side of the battlefield, so make sure you are packing those islands in your basic land library, MTGBC. And lastly, creature number 20, beginning with power and ending with another kind of power, we have a copy of Solitude. Now, the flash is going to be meaningless in Momir Vig because we can only activate our avatar anytime we could cast a sorcery, and that's only once during our turn. But what we end up getting is a 3-2 with lifelink that when it ETBs, we exile up to one other target creature and that creature's controller gains life equal to its power. So basically this comes down as a 3-2 with lifelink and we get to swords to plowshare something. Who knows? Maybe we need to target one of our own creatures to give us enough life to end up winning the game. There we have it. MTGB. BC. 20 more creature cards into the Momir Vig Cube, this time with mana values of 5. Let me know which are your favorites in the comment section below. This is MTG Burgeoning, your channel for all things magic.